in their lives, men go through different stages. With most, it goes like this. They're born, they live, they die. A few try to add to this. <laughs> yeah. At the mental level, trying to make sense of the mind is the same as trying to do so with the stomach. The placard announced the speaker's topic to be language, the entryway to increase knowledge, language, the cattle guard to greater understanding, and he didn't even bother to show up. A man asked himself, how far must one look to find the connectedness of everything? How far is the mysterious from the mundane? How far is the extraordinary from the everyday? And how come all mystical monasteries are closed on Monday? <coughs> The street level justice of it all re-examined again. Attila is never depressed and St. Augustine never satisfied. <laughs> the first explorer to cross the new con continent and look out upon the fresh oceans on the other side thought to himself, so that's why men's brains have twin lobes. <laughs> Today's game is being played between the let it all hang outers and the let's be calm and reserved. This, today's game, is played every damn day of the week, in case you haven't noticed, sir. <laughs> one man thought, the travel's been great, but how do you handle the possibility that there's only one new bus station available in Leach lifetime? I'll just bet that the answer to that is the same as every other mystic's reply to impossible questions. In-town occultism abruptly explained. A psychic in the know can tell a lot about a person from their handwriting. They can, for instance, tell if the person is literate or not, if they're alive or not, and whether they can pay for the reading or not. <laughs> <laughs> the truly sane bypass psychological analyses and psychiatric assistance and go right to the source of the whatever they think it is. For some, the cutting out of the middleman is the elimination of the problem. After a careful study and survey of civilization, one man thoughtfully reflected their own. If, in that setting, we're all yet groping, all still growing, all partial children, stumble bums, boobs, idiots, and one-eyed men on unicycles, then why should one feel pride in being a professional in such a context? Hmm. Prisons have bars, life has guilt, and all parades have a marked route to follow. This query entered one person's mind. Why is all of man's best love, drama, poetry, and literature always about feelings and never thoughts? The more you strive dogs to convert, the greater number of fleas you host. And all of your efforts to defend your position only invites additional attack. I suppose the above could be of metaphorical interest to proselytes and philosophers, but a real neural explorer would find herein hints of actual practical value. But then again, there's always the distinction where the simple see the literal, the more complex see myth, and where the routine see allegory, the few discover hands-on instructions. No wonder no one trusts a mystic. From our department of, my how faster time has learned to fly. This item, popular contemporary quote updated by city observer reflecting man's general lack of perseverance. Says he, everyone should spend at least 15 minutes trying to be famous. <laughs> Another look at the native injustice, injustice of life. There's info and encouragement all around you concerning how to be dumber, cruder, and less conscious. But where is the other side of the coin? Another feature for just the regular folks out there in our audience. The Mystical Adventure Part 86. The younger make the more excited seekers and the older the bigger fools. Somewhere in between is where the right path lies. <clears throat> oh, by the way, as poignant and pithy as that sounded, it's not true. <laughs> the right path is wherever you find it, not where anyone says it is. One man tried to send part of his brain to camp, but discovered it was more efficient to send camp to that part of his brain. City infomercial news. Over there, people will pay to have you beat them up, and people will pay for you to offer sympathy for their beatings. But the one thing they won't pay for is to have someone explain the situation to them. 
But just think, if people weren't smarter than horses, they'd have no problem superior to the equestrian variety. Moral, there is a purpose to all things, but all the purposes are all the same. One father told his son, fairness is in not asking anyone else to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself. In the lad's mind, Sigurd really replied, nay, fairness would be in not asking anyone else to do anything. <clears throat> Ask yourself this, is there a difference between thinking about something and being conscious of it? And to the quick eye, the immediate and obvious answer is yes. But then you begin to think about it. <clears throat> the welfare of mankind as a whole is in part seen to by the spokespersons for his many common institutions. The sane should lead the mundane and the bland should direct the complacent. A true explorer is on his own. From the neophyte physician's handbook, if you don't make patients believe they're sick, they won't accept your prescription, and they won't accept your prescription unless it has a definite name. This is also a brief history of the visible evolution of the human thinking machine. A neural warrior's story. One day, a certain knight had a severe shiver when he thought, what will happen if I ever quit finding life so funny? <laughs> Friendship is not charity, nor is the reverse so. Not only do the ordinary whine too much, but at another level they mystically inclined are inclined to do so even more. Yeah, you're right. That ain't funny. <clears throat> the reasons that there are no satisfying answers to any of man's important questions is because they're not supposed to be. And if you're pondered, is this anything like the man who used to pass by the dam every day and every day claimed that it was breaking? A man who understands language can wrestle it to the ground and make it look really ridiculous. But language doesn't care. What the hell does language have to care about? Why don't you take a lesson from language? <laughs> City culture. Men read so that they won't have to listen to the radio. Men listen to the radio so that they won't have to watch TV. <laughs> men watch TV so that they won't have to think. And some men think so that they won't have to read. <laughs> Say, injects one viewer, how'd the term some men slip in there? City culture. Love it or hate it, it's still your culture if you live in the city. For all of you first families and mainliners of the outskirts hobo village, this item. The way you can, can definitely spot a man who knows what's really going on around here is that he never tells anyone what's really going on around here. One man painted the inside of his skull with reflective paint so that his brain would have something interesting to look at. The other name of civilization is predictability. The middle name of sanity is reliability. And the real name of everyday low level 40 watt just barely making it intelligence is dependability. <laughs> Guess where that leaves expanded consciousness. And also you can see why it's not called an ask out more on Friday nights. <laughs> Yes, some mystics do live in caves and some in monasteries, but far too many of them live in their head. See, fish feel at home in the water. Birds feel comfortable in a nest, so you can't expect a heck of a lot more from the brain right off the bat. An untitled item related to God knows what. <clears throat> if you don't dress up funny or act funny, how do you know you are one? From his office window, the president of the university looked down on the day's student demonstration and thought to himself, there's nothing wrong with youthful idealism, but wouldn't it be something to be able to still act so after you discover that there's nothing to be idealistic about? More strange medical facts and human curios. Trying to think just inflame one man's mind worse than it was normally. The ordinary believe in myths 
because it makes them feel important. Mystics like them because they want to be like them. One man says he thinks that people who want to be mystics just want to do so so that they won't be so miserable. <laughs> After some considerable time of being bombarded by non-standard ideas, one man's mind screamed, I can't take much more of this. And the man replied, good, that's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> While unsaddling his steed one day, a certain Ural knight suddenly realized life can change so quickly that there's really little need to take a trip. But only a man who can properly discover such can make life change. Only the unenlightened see a need for being humble, and only the stupid feel a need to brag. The speaker noted, Men have tried to dance their way to higher states of consciousness. They have tried to chant their way there. And they have tried fasting their way, even eating their way. And someone in the audience asked, So what is left? And he replied, What has ever been left? And thereby were a few present struck with the reality of it all. After some study and experience in the area, one man decided instead of actually trying to become a mystic that he'd just think and talk about it until he got sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> Can work every time. <clears throat> the dull always envied the enthusiastic. Always? I said always, damn it. Another untitled item in reference to some matter unspecified. Literal religion is one interpretation of it. In the privacy of his own symbolic workshop, one man thought, thinking what you've already thought is the worst possible form of incest, and as is becoming increasingly clear to me, does encourage the predominance of weak, regressive genes. Civilization knew it had it made when it realized that people would pay to hear other people talk. <laughs> Myth. There was once a great mystery that everyone sought. It lived in a dark, hidden cave. Then one day someone drug it out into the light and everyone lost interest in it. And now for some post-myth analysis. <laughs> well, tell me, Bart, just what did they expect would happen? Gee, Kurt, that's a tough one. Back to you. <laughs> At first it was, I have become the kind of man who wants to become a particular kind of man. And then it was, I have become the kind of man I used to laugh at. And then I have become the kind of man I used to secretly admire. And finally it was, I have become the kind of man I originally wanted to be. Another way in which uh, humans are unique of this galaxy is in the matter of enthusiasm and excitement. To begin with, humans, and up to this point you can parallel animals, which is no great importance and we're about to leave it, but humans, you run originally off the excitement of hormones, basically sex, it would appear to be perhaps individual survival, but is a little wider view of it, it is the enthusiasm, the need, the genetic need for the survival of the race known as man. So, your early days, that kind of feeling the way it's described now, the enthusiasm, the rebellion, just the excitement inherent or native in teenagers is sexual. In other words, it is hormonal. That it is not that different from other animals on this planet. But by the time, let's just say everyone reaches their maturity, by the time that happens, and we're speaking not culturally or psychologically, by the time you reach that kind of hormonal stage, which let's just say is 21, just to average it, after that, man is unique in a sense that does not just, that is different from animals, it is distinguishable in that no other creature 
possesses this, and that is the need to stay enthused. Now, other animals, you could say, carry the parallel just another foot further in spite of what I said, so that you understand, animals do stay enthused enough, dogs and cats and hippos, to eat, stay out of harm's way, get out of the sun, take a vacation, don't get overstressed, cut down on fatty foods, enough to go ahead and live. But there's no great excitement. And part of civilizations and man's institutions, what they reflect is the coming of age of man. That is what should be, or what is in a sense, we'll get to should be in a minute, but what is in a sense a different level of enthusiasm. Let's get cruder to the point. Uh, you're all excited about being alive, no matter what you thought it was. And uh, I know that many people had, and all of you, many people here have some artistic talent. But what if your dreams were that what was going to happen in life? I grew up and uh, I'll become a famous musician, famous writer, or I'll end up be the most beautiful woman or the biggest, handsomest guy in the world or football player, whatever. And all of that, in those teen years, which is when it happens, all of that is actually just a spilling over into consciousness, into the neural zone of hormones. That's all it is. And what is a blind man can see is by the time you do reach maturity, it's just one of the ways you tell that people are matured. It's part of the colloquial, everyday conversation, the conventional wisdom of people, one way that you know that some guy down the street, somebody's son or your son, if you had children, that the way they have calmed down is that they've calmed down. They've become matured. And they have quit hanging around bars and trying to get a job in a band, or they've, they've given up the idea of finally getting a scholarship and go to college and be drafted into the pros. Well, they gave it up somewhere along the line of having flunked the ninth grade three times in a row. And here they are at 22, and the school says, we wish you would you know, go ahead and leave and get a job or something. It is the giving in. It is the turning of whatever the person happened to appear to be at the time when they were a teenager. It is the turning from that. It is the metamorphosis from being that to a middle class boob, to a good burger, to a good everyday middle class householding mother, father, son, I mean mother, father, family person. That is being mature. That enthusiasm that was run hormonal, which, over which you had no control and which people do not even normally analyze in any neural manner. Once that goes, it's gone. Now people try to revive it spasmodically and they futilely through drugs, through memories, through reminiscence, through class reunions, through hair transplants, through nose jobs, boob enlargements, hyposuction, suction, or whatever. <laughs> I don't think I'll go on with that. <laughs> it lends itself too readily to humorous pseudo-misspeak. So. <clears throat> uh, for this to have any depth, you've got to, as always, you've got to listen past just a two-dimensional telling of the words or even a three-dimension because there's more afoot. But do just realize this. Uh, it's been observed throughout history, and there has been passing attempts at ordinary people to make something of it. They do not simply describe the situation. They attempt to make something psychological out of it which is good because it shows that the parade of life is still progressing along, that they're taking something that is not actually, it does not have a big enough foot in the camp of, neurolo uh, of neurons, but they describe it as such. That is describing the downfall, the petering out, as it were, of one's great hormonal drive, normally as a teenager, and it begins to sort of weaken. They attempt to describe that in neurological terms psychological terms, which does show the parade. It's like saying, well, I believe the parade is going to turn up here at 3rd Street, and it's not quite there yet, and it may not even turn at 3rd Street. But it is the human mind being driven collectively to try and speak of the future. Back to my attempted more crude telling. 
you get over for whatever reason, and there's always excuses as part of being normally verbal and neural, being conscious in the ordinary sense, is uh, you now, you'll have some story that if somebody sees you a few years after high school, a few years after your mature years have firmly clutched you, and they run across you on the street and they say, well, hey, are you still writing music? Are you still painting? Are you still doing so-and-so? And you go, well, and they go, oh, I thought you were so. And you go, well, the, the oldest story has always been, well, you know, that girl I used to live with, she got pregnant. And then she got pregnant a second time. And then my father wouldn't give me any more money. I don't know, just like life caved in. And it doesn't take much of a whine or excuse. All you got to do is say that. And if the other person is reasonably sane, they go, yeah, tell me about it. So they excuse it, or they, they have some story, and that's not it. It simply happens. And to try and explain that, to try and analyze it, or especially to explain it in psychological terms, is art for the collective, but is misleading. It is non-informative. It is unenlightening. It happens. It is there. It is there throughout the world. What makes man unique? Now, after that, one more time, remember that you do, of course, have the enthusiasm. If you're sane, you have the enthusiasm if you want to call it that, to get up every day, to go to work, to feed your children, to stay in reasonably good health, and try your best when you check down your height to see what Aetna says that you should live. The actuary table said that you should live to 68, you know, if, since you smoke two packs and drink a fifth of bourbon every second day and you never exercise. Well, maybe in your case it says 65. And so being a decent person, you think, oh, all right, I'll shoot for 65. So you do your best, if you want to call that enthusiasm. <laughs> but there is, uh, as bad as looking back, or as useless as it can be, I'm just assuming that all of you are still tight enough to the central core of the genetic fuel running life to be entertaining all this and listening, that you can recall what I'm saying with no presence, but you simply can recall that there was a time that you were absolutely enthusiastic about being alive. And I don't try to analyze it, and especially don't try to explain it and say, well, yeah, I thought I, was, I, thought I had real talent in painting or writing or in sports. And, you know, I finally got, got a little older and got, got around some of my heroes, moved and got up to New York for a while, and I saw what was going on, and I realized, Phew, well, I'll never make it. That's not true. You simply grew up. Your damn hormones ran down. Sex began to run down, that's all it is, and it happens. So you do, but I just want to admit that everyone, if you're sane, that is one of the operative definitions or descriptions, again, of sanity, is at least, once you get mature, and in the sense I'm describing it tonight, and lose, you get mature and you lose that original creative burst of enthusiasm, which was sexual, once you lose that, part of the definition, or a good operative definition of sanity is, at least after that, and let's say 20, at least for another 45 years, you can act enthusiastic enough to get up and go to work and to shave and to stay reasonably clean and to keep your house and yard reasonably kept up enough that the neighbors don't run you out of town. In other words, you can at least put forth the effort to get up and play like you're an ordinary person. But you must know by now. Uh, psychology, sociology, religion, everybody tries to analyze it, it's just another hobby, but you should know from yourself that there is a quantum, a discrete change comes over a person at maturity. That's why it is taken into account in such a serious and such an all-encompassing manner throughout history. It is that you have calmed down enough to become part of civilization, of the local society, that you have become dependable, reliable, predictable, which is civilization itself and its internal individual counterparts or individual parts. But on top of all of that, that we've already established that the ordinary, the middle class, those that are the heart of the parade of civilization, of humanity, they will continue to exercise enough, and we should put in quotation marks, like enthusiasm, to get up and fake it for another 40 or 50 years. <laughs> but there is something else afoot. See, because that was not a condemnation of man. That is a fact. But there is another fact. 
that on top of that laid like an overlay on it, the same way in which man neurally is an overlay over man hormonally, the same way that civilization has an overlay over the feral animal life of man. In that same way, there is another dreamed of, theorized, imagined, proffered degree of enthusiasm. Once you are matured and you've lost that original sexual burst, that kind that is singular, serves a purpose, and cannot be reenacted. And now we're not talking about just sex itself, we're not talking about that, but that enthusiasm, that kind of burning the whole thing that makes kids be idealistic, that makes people demonstrate, that makes, well, idealistic, if you didn't catch someone tonight that was in there for a purpose, is the president of the university looked out there at the day's demonstration for the students and thought, well, there's nothing wrong with idealism. Of course, I should have said the strange president of the university, but you, under, you knew that or you wouldn't have had any insight. He'd have sent down the police, stop that. <laughs> Told you people not to do that. Of course, remember, he was hot in his window. So if he was an ordinary president, that is, that was your part of your brain looking at that other part of your brain, it would say, what do you mean demonstrating? What do you mean being enthusiastic and having ideals? You're 40 years old. That part of your brain would say the other part, and you go, you're right. But back to the story. He looked down at the day's student demonstrations and thought to himself, there's nothing wrong with youthful idealism. Dice. But damn, wouldn't it be something if you could continue to act like that, you've discovered there's nothing to be idealistic about. I use that in the widest possible sense. It might have hit some of you more directly if I just said protest, complain about, that he could look down at them demonstrating, complaining about something like, stop the war in such and such place. You know, you just leave it blank and you can, from year to year, you fill in whatever they'd, you know. peace now. Well, where do you have in mind? Well, I don't know where they're fighting. That kind of idealism. And he was pointing out to himself, wouldn't it be something, which it would be, that was a rhetorical question to his old self, wouldn't it be something if you could retain that, if you could still act that kind of, in that idealistic a manner, after you discover there's nothing to be idealistic about? Which is another way of saying, wouldn't it be something if you could continue to be, have that kind of youthful enthusiasm, even after you don't have it? Uh, okay. But now we've already taken care of that which does not seem to be possible. I thought we had, but life, back to where we were, life puts an overlay. So, you know, it's the kind of thing that makes it interesting even to talk about, maybe. <laughs> you get over the enthusiasm, which I'll assume all of you seem to be. I mean, just judge on your age. You're over 20 or 21, it's gone. I mean, that's a fact. Your hormones have gone, in a, they're serving other purposes. You're now, instead of a at least from a male view, which is the most exemplary of it. <laughs> well, they, it's not to discount the distaff side because men wouldn't be like that. One, you know how it is. The sex is range, but I was just saying that men are the boys are the greatest example because they are actively out there as you know, young wild bucks and fighting around for women. That kind of enthusiasm, you know, they run up the edge of a cliff if they were around and just they just willing to die. They don't give a damn. <laughs> all they want, all they want to do is. You know, to find a female sheep. You know, another one gets in the way and there's, there's no female sheep around for the time being. Or if they see one and this guy's in front of him, you know that, they'll fight to the death. Even if they don't fight to the death, they fight until they both, you know, so dizzy they can't stand up. You know, they go out and have a beer and they'll start all over. That kind of thing when it's gone. That's what I meant. It cannot be revived. But what he was pointing out was what if it could. Now back to where we were. The overlay, once you understand that that's gone. That enthusiasm, life does not leave it there. What do you think civilization itself is in part about? It is, but it's very subtle and it's at a different level, but it is encouraging men to be enthusiastic. I put it to you several times over the last week or so in different ways, hidden in little kernels and dingbats, is life does encourage everyone to do better. <laughs> But it's kind of, you know, it's not real direct, and it, well, it encourages everyone to do better, but then doesn't tell you how to do it. I gave you several versions. All right, now consider it this way. The whole thing about doing better to improve oneself requires, 
And once you see it, it's synonymous with enthusiasm. But normally the enthusiasm, the level at which it works, the level at which life needs it to work with the ordinary, is so minimal that it's almost, well, it's difficult for the ordinary mind to even see it. As you can't really realize that it's going on. It's not generally taken into account. All of man's institutions, religion, education, uh, of course all of these are just different arms of the same beast of civilization. Uh, the arts, all, everything in the arts, all literature, all of it to varying degrees, but all of it, I don't mean there's an exception, it's just a varying intensity according to how you're wired up. They are all for the intention of giving a new level a different kind of enthusiasm. That here you are if you're a male, and you women can surely follow this, it's not in any way limited sexual, but here it is, you got the guy and he gave up the idea. Or you nowadays women are not immune to it. The dream of I'll be somebody famous, I'll become a famous ballerina or painter or dancer. And then suddenly there you are at 22 and somebody brings it up, somebody has the gall to say, well, what happened to your career? Oh God, Jesus, you didn't find out I got pregnant twice. <laughs> No, I don't know. Sure you don't know. But once that happens, life still encourages a certain kind of enthusiasm. And it comes out, though, at such levels as this. You, you go to the ballet if you wanted at one time to be a ballerina. And if, you know, that may get to be too much of a drag, and you just subscribe to American dance or whatever, you know, American ballerina. And you subscribe to that for a while until they up the subscription rate. <laughs> And then maybe you'll watch it on TV if it's convenient. <laughs> uh, I know it's easy to laugh, I'm, and I'm not being sarcastic, because every human does it without some form of this veneer, of this, I could make up another term, but I'm assuming you understand. It's the encouragement, it's that the original sexual enthusiasm leaves everyone, at least to the degree at which it was. It cannot be recaptured, it goes up to a certain apex, and then it levels off. And that's it, hormonally, physically. But life does not simply let go at that. Or we would, we would be no different than animals. It then brings on like a new stage. You get mature, you reach the point that the hormones begin to go down. And you don't, of course, do not sit around and analyze it this way. But then you begin to take up more mature hobbies and interests such as, well, I'll go to ballet. Or you begin to buy records when you gave up wanting to be a musician. And that kind of enthusiasm. Whatever it was, life is encouraging. Some continued, but it's like, like a different level. And you don't notice it, but it's like, don't give up. Don't give up and just become a 45-year-old couch potato. Well, don't become a couch potato for the next 45 years, I should say. It's like life telling a 20-year-old. It's like, oh, don't do that. But now, see, this is where it's interesting. On one hand, it is saying, yeah, do that. Because it's already done it to you. It already took away the hormonal enthusiasm that was sexual in nature, and so here you are mature. There is no danger now. Now forget, you know, you will have an excuse, but there's no danger now that you're going to leave your wife or husband and the two kids you have, and the mortgage. There's no doubt, there's no danger. You're not now, after that age, you're not going to suddenly one day just disappear and end up living in Greenwich Village or Soho or around the artistic community in Rome or now Budapest. You're not going to run off and do it. And when you do, of course, it is a kind of anomaly that will make the news. Middle-aged banker disappears, tells his wife he's going out for bagels and never returns. <laughs> and took her credit card. There is no danger. If you're sane and middle class, if you're sane and part of the civilization itself, you do not do that. But life, life's already established that. That's what the sane middle class, that's what humanity as a whole is. But it does not let it go at that or you would simply be a human. Then you would be, for the next 45 years, just a couch potato. Life encourages a different form of enthusiasm. Now at one level, uh, as easy as it is to find holes in religion, for instance, almost as easy as it is psychiatry, or banking, or the law, 
Our insurance sales. Oh, damn. Well, I'll have to stop somewhere. At any rate, religion seems to be an easy one uh, because it's uh, proclaimed goals, the same as psychiatry, are so blatantly impossible that it makes it a sitting duck from one view. I say that on the basis now of pointing out to you that of all other of the individual identifiable aspects of man's civilization, that is, civilization being a post-harmonal, looking at it from an individual, is a post-harmonal peak experience. Not a peak experience, a post-harmonal peak experience. Sometimes you can get too clever verbally for your own good, right? It's a po civilization is an experience for those who have peaked harmonally. Did that make it clear? For the old farts, for people that's, you know, given up that original. But anyway, back to religion, what I wanted you to see, as easy as it is to point out its folly, because it has, it's just set up like the little wooden cats at the carnival. They're just sitting there looking right in your face, that, and psychiatry, saying, well, here's what our goal is, and any fool can come by. The biggest rube in town can come by the carnival and go, if that's the goal, you people are not even close. And it's supposed to be, you know, shut up. What are you, a troublemaker? It's just religion. It's just psychiatry. And with psychiatry, of course, they got sort of a better one. They can go, you sure are angry about this? You know? you know, have, you, have you ever considered professional help? And you go, get away from me! And they go, oh. Yeah. I keep waiting for religion to learn a lesson and take a page. At any rate, religion was originally, religion and all forms of mythology, but religion was, and to some degree still is, at least potential, but was the highest form of encouraging man to be enthusiastic. And uh, we'll, we'll just think about it a second. Without, if you can extract any natural or any mechanical hostility or criticism you may have of any particular religion, think about the whole idea of religion. That was, after man grew up, each person, Adam and, Adam and Eve, got harmonically, they reached the peak and it went like this, and God, you know, kind of went back, we're going to take that story, and Jehovah looked him back up after he drove him out. You know, I've already given that story, and he went, once he saw what was going, he saw, come on, lighten up. Because once he saw what he'd done, and the hormones went up there, and he drew, threw them out of the garden, they became verbal, they became more of a neural creature than just a hormonal one. Then after a while, it's when he looked and he thought, ah. And what he was doing then was trying to encourage him again, like, ah, oh, come on, life's not over. For whatever reason, life, life did not want men to be over at the age of 20. If it did, we'd still be dying at 20. So he tried to enthuse them. He tried to give them another sense of excitement. Like, well, yeah, you know, to Adam, to take that as the example, he said, oh, well, yeah, so you're not walking around with a heart on 23 and a half hours a day. But come on, wait a minute, here's what. And so then, now we've reached a neural level. Not comparing the two, but now it's like another level. And that's what religion, look at, was originally meant to be what we, should be more exciting once you become neural than the idea of like, what if you knew what life was about? What if you knew where you came from? Of course, man's own person can't even think about it. A dog can't think about it. But a man, you know, looks around, what are we doing? Isn't this weird? And he's the one that can do it. And the, a religion originally look at as being the original, the best form, and still potentially in a sense should be the best form, of another type of excitement, enthusiasm. Like think about it. What if you in some way could get in touch with the cosmic force? What if in some way you could, using crude terms with the kind of stuff that they use, but what if you in some way could uh, even psychically regress to the point, to go back to the moment of creation, that you could get in touch, you could look back, as it were, with your own mental telescopes with such speed and such depth that you could look, what it amounts to, spatially, into the past, to the Big Bang itself. What if you knew the secret of life? What if you could talk to the creative forces? What if you knew what was going on? Now that should have been, well it was, the original, the best form of a new version, a new type of enthusiasm. There's no way, remember, I'm trying to bow my thing so you understand this is multi-layered as always. That it's not just this or that. But now consider, assuming that most of you heard some of that, that religion, and some of you, as soon as you heard it, you realize, yeah. Because some of you rightfully probably remember that one time, for some 
period, you had that sort of idea about religion. Your religion or somebody else is like, yeah. That assuming that you had the makings of a would-be mystic at some age, even in the midst of your horny teen years, that you, and you begin to look around and you thought, well, wait a minute, maybe I've been overlooking. It's religion. That's got to be the place. On top of all that, though, assuming that you catch that, that religion is, or should be, or could be, just on the surface, it should be the best form, the best version of this new level, this new type of enthusiasm. That We're now not talking just about the sexual enthusiasm to keep the race going. We're now talking about the neural enthusiasm to keep man growing because he's not growing physically. He's not changing sexually. You know what I'm saying? I'm using sexually synonymously with physical compared to mental. So sexually, there's nothing else to change. People screw, we have kids. That keeps going on and everybody, enough people are properly horny-ized. Don't bother to look it up. <laughs> Enthused physically to carry on the necessary acts of procreation. But then you've got to be enthused up here for men to put up with being civilized, to drive them all forward. And religion should have been, it was at one time the best version. But now notice, it can't overdo it. This again, so that you don't, you know. All right, I described it a few minutes ago. I was saying, think about it, shouldn't that, or it isn't, working at best. You just think about it. Religion would be that which gives man a real new sense of enthusiasm. That you get past being 20 and you find yourself with a job, with a mortgage, and you're kind of like, boy, life is not, I thought it was going to be a great something or other. But now look at me. Then, should it not be like the idea held within religion, like, well, wait a minute. No, you're putting on weight. You're not as horny as you were. You seem to settle down with one woman or one man. you got a family. But wait a minute, life's not over. What if you could have that kind of excitement up here that you used to have down here? Of course, anybody, especially a man, is right now go, yeah, you know, whoo, you know, that's something to ponder. Yes, oh yes, I'll take it sight unseen, yes. And so then as life, what I was trying to describe is like the question you begin to have then, or if, if, life, if religion presented it, put it into words for you initially, like, well, wouldn't you like to know, where are we? How, how big is the universe? Where do we come from? Why are you here? Why, why does man think? What's the purpose of man being able to ask, why does man think? What's the purpose of this? And that gets everybody to varying degrees. But it gets everybody like, yeah. I was backing up for you people because let's assume that you would go, yeah, in a little more passionate manner than the ordinary. You go, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm you know, fooling with now. That's what I'm interested in. But now we could make it sound as though right quick. Don't lose this. But then I could make it sound as though right quick. Well, religion has made a messed up somewhere. Because now, look, religion, rather than being in charge of enthusing men and exciting them, religion is actually nothing but a shill for religion. I mean, for civilization itself. It is a shill for stability. It is really to calm people. That's the whole point, is to civilize them, to make them be more moral, more dependable, less bloodthirsty, less likely to engage in mayhem and theft. You go, yeah, you're right. No, we're just become... The color of everyone's apartment. Yeah. It's become bland, predictable. You could say that, except now. Back to a minute ago when I said, <laughs> it, should it not be, or could you not see that it would have been, or can be, at one time was, the most exhilarating outlet for this new form of enthusiasm. You go, yeah, yeah. Of like, what's the secret of life? Where do we come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, yeah, but now look where it's gone to now. It's just mechanical ritual. And you go, yeah, boy, what a, boy, is it fallen. Back to my first part. Life can't have everybody wandering around being that enthused. It's like Jehovah, life went, well, look, lighten up, Adam and Eve. Now I know I, I drove you out and made you think, which I like the interpretation that ends up the King James Western English version that God said, curse upon you, you got to go out and work. Which ordinary people take that as being the real curse. The real curse is, now you've got to go think. That was the word. But at any rate, what if it said my story? You know, Jehovah says, ah, oh, ease up, lighten up. All right, let me give you another way. A new form of enthusiasm. 
how would you like to know where this voice is coming from right now that's talking to you? How would you like to know where you came from? And got him really excited, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then he had to realize, well, wait a minute, I overdid it. Because I'd drive you nuts. <laughs> I mean, if you had six billion people, now to turn it from Adam and Eve into three billion Adams and three billion Eves, and you had all six billion go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't have that. No work would get done. The stock market would fall apart. I mean, God, just everything would crumble. Everybody would be all excited. Everybody would be wanting to be a mystic. Yeah. So it has to be this kind of justice, this kind of balance, that life is made, or made available just enough of this other form of enthusiasm. Like, well, let's get excited. Life's not over just because you're 20 or 30 or 40. But it, you get the message back at an earlier age. That once you reach that hormonal peak and then start down, you do pick up the message some way that, well, life's not totally over. And I keep saying it goes from varying degrees. Some people pick up religion pretty seriously, that, you know, go to Mass faithfully once or three times a week or whatever. Uh, some people become sports fanatics. Some people take up some sort of hobby of, you know, collecting something, which is all a form to keep some enthusiasm. And to a real crude degree, of course, is drugs and alcohol is that people just drink because it gives that kind of burst periodically that, well, yeah, I feel a little excited just because I got alcohol in my brain. And then other people try it, which is lesser forms in a sense of religion or less collective forms, and they try to do things like meditate and chant. And it's all an effect, an all attempt to affect the brain chemistry because your brain chemistry has been altered once the sexual hormones begin to go downhill at 20. So your brain chemistry is different when you're 21 than it was when you were 17. Life steps in via civilization and says, you, uh, things have changed. And you go, yeah, tell me a secret. And it says things have changed and you're not as excited. You sort of gave up some of your dreams. You're no longer out there doing the football, doing the hoops three hours a day, you're no longer painting all the time, you're no longer writing music. Yeah, yeah, I know. But wait a minute, life's not over. You can't just give up. And so I encourage you to take up, uh, if nothing else, a uh, vicarious participation in whatever you're interested in. Or it will get you in religion, or it will get you in, if you're a little less satis easily satisfied, then perhaps you will end up in what seems to be some sort of mystical, occult activity. But notice this. But now you didn't lose that one spot. See, life can't overdo it. I sort of overstated the case. Not really, but I sort of did. When I said that religion was the purest, most direct, most vital form of offering this new type of enthusiasm. Just think about it. It doesn't matter what religion. Uh, surely, I don't keep to mean to drive you crazy with repeating it, but I want you to understand that religion serves a very distinct purpose. Religion is not some whipping boy or dead horse to kick around because religion was the first vehicle and still the primary one to men collectively, not individual people who are in a hurry, but men collectively, it was the first vehicle, the original and still the best, the most widely used of offering this new form, this necessary new form of offering a purpose to live, that is enthusiasm, to the mind, to the neural aspect of mind, to the neural juices, rather than the hormonal slice sexual ones which have reached their peak. Religion was the original vehicle for it. But then it's so easy to attack it, an individual here and there, or so easy to dismiss it, because it does not succeed. It's that you want to run up and grab religion and say, you know, damn it, tell me the secret. You keep saying that you know it, or you keep saying that that's the purpose. And religion goes, well, yeah, because they didn't have a choice. It, you know, it works for life like you do. And it goes, yeah. And you say, well, what is it? And it goes, I don't know, I don't know. But then if you let go, it goes, well, not, it's not that I don't know anything. <laughs> it's almost like an addiction, I guess. You know, it's like uh, whatever that substitute is for heroin or cocaine, if they get you addicted to something else, it's not quite... It doesn't get you stoned as a real drug. Metho what is it? Methadone. Methadone. Just like it gets you addicted to one little thing, just enough that, you know, makes life bearable. <laughs> but remember, it couldn't do otherwise. I mean, it has to strike a certain level that it cannot have a whole world of running around flaming wild-eyed would-be mystics thinking, listen, I ain't going to be satisfied. You're going to have to kill me talking to life. You're going to have to kill me. I'm going to find what's going on here. 
And of course, if you're that type, you're already somewhat of an anomaly or somewhere back when you and life looked dead in the eye, you'd only blink to one eye and that sort of thing. That is, you suspect, in a way, when I say suspect, it's more than just suspicion. It's more than just rank suspicion. It's double rank. That you suspect it's possible to know what's going on or you wouldn't be wired up like you are. And so then, to that kind of individual's perspective, it gets to the point about, listen, don't tell me to calm down. You're the one that wired me up like this. I want to know what's going on. I'm going to find out. Are you some bitch? You're going to have to kill me. Or you're going to have to stop me. Which is not enough of us. The life will do it. That's why life will put up with such as that. If you want to say put up with it, and you can think, well, I am somebody important. There's no way to look at it. Out of six billion people, you're saying, hey, I ain't giving up. I'm going to find out. You know, screw you. And just saying, hey, life will put up with that. He must think I'm important. <laughs> Religion becomes two things. It becomes, it was and is the original vehicle for the medium for introducing to man this new level, this new type of enthusiasm, this excitement about being alive. But now the excitement is not down in the sex organs. It's up here, which is about as far removed as you can get from the sex organs. By the way, those of you that wonder why civilization so condemns pornography constantly. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's always been condemnable. Do you ever think why? And forget all the things. Well, the Baptists say that right here in the book it says, no, no, no. Life through civilization to the collective of man continually harps on pornography. Like, boy, you know, this is running everything. You think, what the hell? Who cares whether there's a bunch of pictures of people screwing? What's that going to do? And life throughout the ages. That was a little side. I threw that in for free. It is life through religion offered man up to first the initial, the paradigmatic version of this new form of enthusiasm. Is you can be enthused now up here, where you've got to be collectively, or men wouldn't do it. Life moves it. So here it is. You can be enthused up here, and religion was the primary and the original vehicle for it. That not fooling around, it's not like maybe if you take up stamp collecting, you might finally get one of the, whatever it is, three of those stamps of an upside down airplane that's worth $10 million or something. Now that may sound enthusiastic, you know, really exciting to a philatelist. But that's nothing. Or to find, to find the missing album that the Beatles, some boot line, you know, anything that you think, the one thing. Uh, that's nothing. Religion says, the secret. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it has to hold that out, and then it has to calm you down. So collectively, looked at one way. It's not either right or wrong, but looked at as the operative description of religion collectively is a calming effect. But it's not strictly that, you've got to understand. If it was just strictly that, it would be a damn NyQuil bottle. <laughs> it would just be a drug. It does both. It is the original carrot and the stick. It is the original tickling, like wake up and get enthused. And it's the same. This other hand is going, now don't you get too excited. It's like tickling and goosing up here in the head. And at the same time, every now and when you get a little too excited, it goes, calm down. <laughs> Fall on your knees, light a candle, say a prayer. Now calm down. <laughs> it does it both. Then you might think, some of you got that. Then you might think, well, wait a minute, the very things that are normally referred to as mysticism and occultism and now New Ageism and all that, the Sufis and the Zens. And then you would think, well, wait a minute. Then, assuming you're following what I'm saying, and I'm speaking for you because I'm the one, at least I observe it. Then you would say, well, wait a minute. Then they have to be the ones who have held on to at least a greater degree of the initial enthusiasm of religion. That instead of the kind of watered-down civilized version, they should be the still beholders, the protectors of the original enthusiasm. It's got to be true. And to a certain degree it is, in the same way that to a certain degree religion, even collectively, is an agent for enthusiasm. Except when you turn around and look specifically an individual and say, all right, I want more. I want to be more enthused. And then it goes, I'll come, now come off. Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> it's the same situation with what appears to be 
nameable, systematized, would-be mystical activities throughout the world. It's not that they do not do a better job. It's not that they will not offer some more degree of enthusiasm, the opportunity to partake greater thereof, but then you have a new, shall we call it stumbling block? Why not? We're running out of time. Problem. <laughs> Situation. That sounds better. That is, what if uh, some great secret voice of which you had no doubt of its validity, of its validity of which you had no doubt, told you religion used to be or was the original vehicle for mass enthusiasm, but not enough to help you individual. And you went, I knew that, I suspected that, and he says, okay, uh, these kind of mystical type schools, they're the ones that have kept more of the original enthusiasm in the ways in which you could individually partake thereof. And you go, I knew that too, I knew that too. And it says, yeah, but I got to tell you this, there's one situation. And you say, you mean problem? And I say, well, I hate to say that. And you say, well, what is it? And you say, well, if it doesn't do something to dampen your enthusiasm, you won't be attracted to it. No. And you'll go, what the hell does that mean? You're crazy. And life will say, no, 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 no. Of course, life will put up with a whole bunch of crap. And you go, well, what do you mean? It has to do something to dampen my enthusiasm. And they'll say, all right. It's going to have to give you some kind of method. It's going to have to give you some kind of task to undertake. And you go, wait a minute. If I'm hearing you correctly, that's the very thing I want. And then life will go. Because that knows you're all right. That you're not going to give any undue trouble. Well, what you must do is be able to remember your breath at every moment. You must remember, you must be able to feel the secondary pulse of the juices through the brain. You must be able to remember one of the infinite names of God. You must be able to never lose focus of your attention. And you can go, I like them all, I like them all. And life, <laughs> life says, good, pick one. You know what the ultimate enthusiasm is? It worked out where I can leave it at a real, like I know you enjoy, a real point in the road that you can forget the devil and Robert Johnson. <laughs> the great place where Enigma meets what the hell's going on highway. <laughs> the ultimate form possible for a human neurally for another level of enthusiasm is one where there is no marked route. Right, and so we're going to start a club based on that. Yes, let's take up a collection and so we can buy, so we can rent a clubhouse and print up membership forms. Well, good. So how much money do you people, are you prepared to lose? Well, the amount you're prepared to lose is what you're prepared to invest. I thought that was clear. Well, yes, let's start, let's start some sort of organization on the basis, if that's true, if I heard what you said, that we go past there being a method to it, a system, something we must do to reach. And if that, that is the closer partaking of the new form of enthusiasm, and if I want, yeah, let's do it by God. <laughs> so you have then fallen from my clutches, at least verbally, back to life. Life looks at me and picks up the bets again. Of course, you're an idiot. Anybody has to be betting against life anyway. But you've lost. But you do see the enigma crossing the mystery or the astonishment. But that's the only way that you can get anything going. That's the only way that you can apparently improve upon. That is the continuing attempt to uh, modify, to correct religion, to give it a new emphasis is to come up with a new, well, wait a minute, here's what we should do, some f new ritual, some new form. All of that is life's way of saying, all right, get excited, get excited. And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say, well, not that excited. And you go, okay. <laughs> the excitement that it cannot be normally stood and that most people can't even find their way to is there is no boundary. There is no s s path to wander off of, no path to find. There is nothing that I am struggling against. There is, but I'm not going to talk about that. It's nothing that you ordinarily know 
that you could struggle against that you struggle against because if you struggle against something that you already know about, it's life got you again. Da 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 da. Oh no 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 no. Tickle tickle. And you start to laugh and go da da da. Tickle tickle. No no no. <laughs> See, that's why this is so plain. And this, well, it is. It is so plain that you keep wanting to go what what. All right, next time I got this whole new method that I've been holding out for years. <laughs> it works. Of course, the question is, if it works, I don't want any part of it. Mm -hmm.